This podcast is part of the Democracy Group. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are talking politics and religion without killing each other. Without killing each other. I should emphasize that. I just sped through it. Um, I am your host, Corey Nathan. It's an honor to be a part of the Democracy Group, a network of podcasts that examines what's broken in our democracy and how we can work together to fix it. Remember, it would really be helpful if you could write a review for the show. We love getting the ratings. Those are great. But actually writing a review, especially if it's an Apple, does make a huge difference in terms of our rankings, discoverability, so more people could participate in these types of conversations, more civil, more nuanced discussions about politics and religion and democracy and all this important stuff. And today we will be talking about some important stuff with Curtis Chang. Uh, (laughs) Curtis Chang is a public theologian and consulting faculty member of Duke Divinity School, a senior fellow at Fuller Theological Seminary, very close to my heart and our home, actually. Um, He is the founder and executive director of Redeeming Babel, a ministry that helps Christians make sense of the wider world. He's written for a wide range of publications from the New York Times, Christianity Today, has made a lot of appearances on CNN, CBS, ABC, NBC, PBS, and NPR's All Things Considered, and talk politics and religion without killing each other. He's a return, a return visitor. Um, he's also the host of the Good Faith Podcast, which I really love, um, and he's the co-author of a book we'll discuss today titled The After Party, which is part of a larger project. And just last year published a very timely, important, and success. And the book was very successful. The anxiety opportunity: how worry is the doorway to your best self. But I got to tell you, Curtis, if you grew up with a Jewish mother like I did, anxiety does not feel like any sort of opportunity, except unless the opportunity is like I'm going to start drinking at nine in the morning. <laughs> Help me understand opportunity, anxiety. What's that all about? Yeah, well, it's actually related to politics uh, in, 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 a, in a way. I mean, I think anxiety is a deeper human reality than just politics. But one of the reasons I wrote that book before 2024, when we knew that uh, my organization was going to launch this project called The After Party uh, with David French and Russell Moore, is that I actually think it's really important to make sense of anxiety in some ways before you try to make sense of politics and to try to have a healthier view towards anxiety before you try to have a healthier view of politics because so much of what is happening in politics today is fueled by anxiety. It is uh, where anxiety is driving it, where anxiety is being weaponized. Um, And so uh, if you're not aware of that, this underlying emotional driver that is happening in our politics, uh, you can really miss what's going on. You can get caught up in Uh, kind of head level talking, which again, that's important. But you miss that what's happening at the heart level. And as anybody who, you know, knows how the human uh, mind and body and spirit works, uh, the emotions are, especially when they're unknown, uh, are far more powerful than our rational thoughts. And so if you can't surface underneath, again, like I said, the driving anxiety that is fueling so much of the polarization and hostility in our politics, then you sort of talk up here at the head level about issues, about different positions, about grievances and so forth, not realizing that we're all actually really, really anxious and we're engaging with each other out of that anxiety. Yeah, you're, you're already hinting at something I wanted to explore with you today, the what versus the how. But I, I, I want to follow up on what, something that you just said. I, I think it was a conversation maybe with on Russell Moore's show uh, last spring, and you were talking about the measurable rise in churchgoers latching on to conspiracy theories. And I know you did some work in particular on vaccines, um, COVID vaccines, certain narratives. There, there are many other narratives, um, great replacement theory or um, QAnon, you know, QAnon, yeah, yeah. the, so the how, steal, you know, of the election, yeah. right? All of those Stop are the conspiracy steal. theories. Yeah. So, how does anxiety connect with this? Uh, rise in belief in conspiracy theories? That's a great question. I think it's important to unpack that because it, it, it perfectly illustrates the point I was just making, where if you try to talk to people about conspiracy theories at the level of facts and fact checking, you really find you get very little progress because, again, driving the conspiracy theories is actually anxiety. To understand mm. the connection between anxiety and conspiracy theories, let's really first understand what anxiety is. 
Anxiety is a natural human reaction in the face of uncertainty, especially the uncertainty that may involve loss. Right? Basically, when we think there's a, something in the future which may actually inflict loss upon us, where we suffer a loss of something we value, that is going to, is going to trigger the emotional uh, symptoms of anxiety, which which is a hard uh, experience to actually hold in ourselves, right? So everything in us wants to get rid of this feeling of anxiety that comes up, right? And so it's natural that if we can't tolerate anxiety, um, if we can't tolerate the feelings that arise with the possibility of some future loss, then we want some picture of the world that removes all uncertainty, that removes all, all uh, um, sort of an all possibility of loss, right? So this is why when you unpack all of these conspiracy theories, what they all purport, even though they all have sort of very different factual uh, or, or claims to fact, I would say, uh, they all share a common emotional thread, which is they all promise an answer to uncertainty. They tell you, this is the way the world works. Here's what has happened for sure. And it turns out to be this sort of, you know, kind of hidden truth that they're being revealed. And a thread running through that is, and if you uh, adhere to this conspiracy theory and follow its dictates, this will be the way that you get out of uncertainty and especially in many cases, out of the possibility of loss. Um, so you take something like QAnon, it's like, why this gets at the anxiety that a lot of people, a lot of Christians feel, understandably so, about you know the loss of our culture and whether our culture, especially on values of sexuality, uh, are going to become harmful and inimical to our values, to our children's, how we want to raise our children, and so forth. That's a legitimate anxiety. That's a real understandable fear. I I have that anxiety, right? But what QAnon does is says, I'm going to give you the answer for why this is happening. I'm going to give you the precise coordinates for what, where, what is driving all this, which is this, you know, sort of secretive uh, cabal that, you know, exists uh, to promote pedophilia and all sorts. So it's, 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 a non, it's nonsensical in the sense of there's no claim to fact. But it's deeply emotional in that it's speaking, I know you have this anxiety, it's subconsciously saying, and I'm going to explain to you where all of this is coming from and what we need to do. And, you know, we need to target this secret cabal, and then that will get rid of all of the possibility of loss that we feel, the loss of our deeply treasured, legitimate spiritual cultural values, right? So it's this weird, I guess it's not weird, it's, it's in some ways it has a certain very logic to it in, in that... What conspiracy theories do is, is it, it, it's a way for people to latch onto an explanation of the world uh, that takes care of momentarily their feeling of anxiety because it, it addresses that sense of uncertainty. It gives them a very clear picture of the future, um, like, like QAnon, right? It tells you, it gives you a very precise prediction on this date. President Trump will return to power. And then it's, okay, great, I know. I've got a, I've got a clear picture of the future, and Trump is going to save me from all of the losses that I fear. Um, and then, of course, but like any drug that only temporarily takes addresses, it's a short hit of certainty in the face of a world that has a lot of un deep uncertainty. It's a short hit, and that, but it doesn't last. It doesn't actually address it. And so, like any drug, you have to keep going back for it for the next hit of certainty, of reassurance, of future, you know, clear predictions, right, that make you, f uh, assure you from, from all your anxiety. So this is why conspiracy theories also have this common thread of being addictive, that it, it really draws people mm -hmm. in and people get in deeper and deeper and they need the more and more information they need about that, you know, more and more flow of content from this conspiracy theory because they, they're going back for more of the drug. Like conspiracy theories are like Xanax, for Christian anxiety. Oh, that's an interesting way to put right. it. Uh, and so it's like, I, I need to go back for the next hit to address yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. So uh, I've, I'm friends with folks who would call themselves atheist or agnostic. Uh, we might think of them as cynics, uh, albeit secular cynics, um, who would say that once you, once you make that leap of, in, in our case, um, uh, a risen Christ, a risen Jesus, right? A bodily risen Jesus, that miraculous thing that we believe in. Or some of the friends I go to church with, I am not a young earth creationist, but once you buy into a six literal 24 hour day uh, creation story, six something thousand years ago, 
it's not really that much of a leap to think of Jewish space lasers, dead dictators zapping voting machines. <laughs> you know, so how how might you, as as a Christian, as a believer, and how how is it the Holy Spirit? Are we de- are we um, depending on discernment from the Holy Spirit to make that distinction of? I don't know. Now I'm sounding like a cynic, but what miracles we believe in and what uh, miracles are really conspiracies? No, I, I think it's the exact opposite. I mean, we do not. The resurrection of Jesus is not a conspiracy theory. It is a historical uh, fact in terms yeah. of now it's contention. It's, it's not right. accepted by everybody, but it's not rooted in some fantasy. It is rooted in concrete historical realities that you have to contend with. Now, as with all accounts of history, uh, it's not like a slam dunk, like all history is con- has is subject to contention. So I'm not saying every human being rationally must believe in the resurrection, but we're not, we're not just spinning this out of thin air. This is based on historical realities. I, I encourage people to read the works, for instance, of Tom, the theologian Tom, Tom Wright, N.T. Wright, oh, which I writes about Tom the Wright. historicity of the resurrection and the historical those, claims. The yeah, first we're, in those we're, big we're, volumes, New Testament yes, and the ex- People of God, was so helpful to me to stabilize me on what I would say was a shaky faith early on mm. when I was a Christian. And then the third volume, on the on the resurrection oh yeah. especially to what you're talking about yeah G- good good stuff sorry sorry to interrupt you but i just no 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 it's, it's just right that work. uh you know the resurrection is as f- is the furthest thing from a conspiracy theory it's actually right. you know we invite people to examine the historicity of this actual event in in history and so uh yeah i would i would just respond and say no we're not we're, we're talking about a very different thing when we're talking about the resurrection If you like this show, you should check out another podcast that I love, Beyond Politics. It's entertaining, informative, and full of conversations with smart people with fresh ideas. Hosted by former U.S. Congressman Paul Hodes and our recent guest, veteran political operative Matt Robeson. They get amazing insiders, authors, analysts as guests. Plus, they have a weekly news discussion show where Republicans and Democrats manage to have real conversations kind of like what we're going for here but they also mean it when they say they go beyond politics so you'll hear from the leading expert on impeachment one week and the lead project scientist for the james webb space telescope the next subscribe to beyond politics anywhere you get your podcasts apple spotify and all the major apps and we will be sure to put links to beyond politics in the show notes Before we move on, I wanted to tell you about something else that's important. Money. (laughs) Uh, Specifically, your money. In all seriousness, I wanted to tell you about my advisor and my friend, George Meza. George runs Meza Wealth Management. And with George, it's not just about money. It's about helping us manage our present and plan for our future. And unlike a lot of other firms out there, George and I actually have a relationship. He knows me, he knows my family, and I know his wonderful family. I also know his firm and the incredible team he's put together from his chief investment officer to some of the other great people in his office, like Jessica, their head of operations that are always there to help me and with all aspects of our portfolio. You see, the thing is, I got a lot going on. I guess we all got a lot going on, and I don't have the time to watch our investments all day, every day. And even if I did, I don't have the experience and expertise that George's team collectively has. So we get the entire Mesa Wealth Management team, all their expertise and all their integrity. And again, it's based on George knowing me personally, knowing my goals, and even the kind of risk that's appropriate for me to take, which, by the way, could change from one season to the next. And they're on top of all of that. So if you want George Mesa and Mesa Wealth Management to be on your team, just visit their website, mazawealth.com. That's M-E-Z-A wealth.com, www.mazawealth.com. And that will also be in our show notes, so you can check that. And now, back to our show. You, you know, so since you bring it up, I, I, what I especially appreciated about the the, the bigger volumes, um, but also all of his more, uh, you know, his 200 page books, not just his six and 800 page books, was that um, Tom Wright risked, he went into that inquiry risking the possibility that he'd come out the other side as a historian having shaken his faith. And he, indeed, 
He had a much more nuanced faith on the other side, but I, it, it was a more deeply rooted faith because of the academic history work that he did. I, I, I'm curious, though, you've at times, you describe your experience as um, disengaging. You, you refer to yourself as you, you're the cynic of the, you know, the triumvirate that started the after party, right? Um, has there been a time in because of our brothers and sisters in the church, how many of them have behaved, frankly, has it given you, has it shaken your own faith? Um, I, I don't think it's shaken my faith in terms of the, you know, if what you're asking is, has the current scandals, uh, divisions, uh, toxicity of the church shaken my faith? I don't think it's shaken my faith. I think it's more, uh, like I said, in the, in, well, I will say in the book coming out where I, I write about my own journey, political journey, um, out of cynicism or into cynicism and out of cynicism, uh, I think it's more that it's actually clarified that the faith that we believe in calls us to engage with the world, right? So the, the, the posture of the cynic, which I have, is one of disengagement from the world. It's the one that says, hey, look, politics and everything else in the world, it's hopeless. I know. And you know, it's, it's both a combination of low hope and low humility. So there's there's right. low humility in that because like I know I can really see better than everybody else. And it's low hope in, in that one thing I'm sure of and what, what, what you all losers don't see is that this is all hopeless. You're, 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 you know, so the cynic is one that's disengaging from the world because he says, I see better than everybody else and everybody else is who is involved in politics or uh, cares about politics um, don't, doesn't see how hopeless it is. Yeah. So that actually is not the Christian view because really, in some ways, because of what we just talked about with the resurrection as being something that is in history. It is not the, the, the promise of Jesus and the resurrection is not I will take you away from this world. But it's actually, I have come into this world to transform this world. I've come into mm. death to have victory over death. So it's not, and this is, again, where the Tom writes, great gift to Christians is to reconfigure the gospel as something that is a suck you out of the world into some disembodied, out of time and space and history heaven out there, but rather heaven, God's realm, coming into the realm of human space, time, and history, and where God most decisively engaged with history and with, with human politics is in Jesus' death and resurrection. So if you're going to believe in Jesus' death and resurrection, the flow is not away from this world and away from politics. It's actually into this world and into politics, but with a fundamentally different message and promise. And the message of promise is not we will transform the world out of our by our political uh, strength, effort, combat, but rather Jesus uh, already has done so in the cross and will continue to do so as he works out the cross and the resurrection in all of human history. So it, sort of draw a full circle, the, Jesus' death and resurrection is a call to the cynic not to stand back and withdraw from the world, but precisely to enter the world. Enter the world with, into all of its seeming hopelessness in the way that Jesus engaged on the cross with the world's seemingly hopelessness, right? I mean, how hopeless it is. Like, I've come here and you're crucifying me to, to bring peace and justice and truth and you're crucifying me. Jesus, you know, would have uh, had the highest claim to say, to be the cynic and say, this is hopeless. Humanity is hopeless that they would do this to me. And yet he said, you know, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And he extended himself into uh, into the world to his very last breath. And so that is a very profound invitation to the cynic to say, hey, you think you see deeper? You think the world is hopeless? Look at Jesus. He did not withdraw from the world, but embrace the world. And so that's that's the call to me as a cynic. So this is such a great preface to why the after party? So I, I've been reading the book. It was such a treat to read it. And by the way, I can't wait to talk to Nancy. Uh, she's coming on uh, the show in a couple of weeks. Um, your co-author of the book, Nancy French. There are a number of other videos, study guides, other resources that you and the team have created. So um, maybe as a as a pre as an introduction, yeah. Can you 
go through exactly what the after party is, who it's meant for too, yeah. um, and the problems that you're trying to address with the project. Yes. So the after party is a, is a project started with David French, uh, Nancy French, and Russell Moore, and myself to equip Christians to, ha- to move towards a better Christian politics. So I'll talk a little bit about the substance of the message, but the format is uh, several formats. So the format that's already out is a video course, a six-session video course that small groups or even individuals can take. Um, So for those listeners who are familiar with Alpha, which is a very popular course that a lot of churches take, uh, Alpha, our tagline is what Alpha does for evangelism the after party wants to do for politics, right? So it's a trusted, high quality resource that actually you can just run in small groups, Bible studies, prayer groups, just friends, families, or take it yourself. Um, Six sessions and um, it's just so well produced. I'm so proud of it. Uh, It was produced uh, by a 10 time Emmy Award winner, uh, DT Slothman. And that's the first offering is the uh, is the course that's out now. And you can go find it on after-party.org. That's after-party.org. Uh, and it's free, completely free for anybody to take. The second version will be the book that I wrote, uh, co-wrote with Nancy French. Uh, that's like a companion volume for people who prefer to engage with material directly uh, in a, by reading a book versus taking a video course. Uh, that's coming out in April. And then we also have a very special... Uh, third element which is going to be a set of songs worship songs uh on it's called songs for the after party which will be coming out in april also we just uh recorded not me i i am not the song i was was just i was meeting with with some a group of uh christian songwriters called porter's gate in nashville uh just that last weekend and uh it's going to be amazing it's going to be some wonderful songs because right now if you were to ask, well, what's a healthy, Jesus-centered song we can sing about our health, our Jesus-centered view of politics? We, there isn't really a lot of options. There's not a lot of options. Like, I would not recommend singing, you know, Onward Christian Soldiers, for instance, as our battle, <laughs> you know, as our worship song for Christian politics. Right. And so, you know, we need something better. And so we're going to be producing a worship set. So it's going to be a, a, a video. It's already a video course. It's going to be a book. And then it's going to be... Um, uh, a set of songs. I can talk more about the substance of the message of the after party if you want. Uh, Corey, tell me where, where you want to take this conversation. I will. I will. I do have yeah. some specific questions. Yeah. We'll get into it. I do want to leave some questions for Nancy when she comes on. The okay, show very too. good. Yeah. But but I was curious. So I I remember a story. I think you told how you and David met uh, doing fantasy baseball or something like that when you were in grad school. Yeah. I was so I was curious if you could share again how you all met yeah. and how this conversation came about. Uh, yeah. That led to the after party. So I've been friends with David French for over 30 years. We're part of a fantasy baseball league that runs that long, that a group of guys starting from law school that uh, you know are very close friends. So David and I are, are very close. And of course, we started the podcast, Good Faith yeah. Podcast, together. That Then he handed it off to me when he went to the New York Times. But we, we obviously talk a lot about the state of uh, the church, the state of the church also uh, in terms of how it's relating to politics. And it's been on our hearts for a while. Like, ugh, we need to heal the the Christian sort of vision of politics because it's tearing the church apart and it's tearing our society apart. And so what can we do? And the idea came to us on a hike uh, on the coast of California. He was visiting me with Nancy and uh, we were just talking about it. And that's really where we came up with the idea. Like, we need to give, we need to provide some curriculum that helps to reshape the Christian view of politics. You know, there's been a lot of books, there's a lot of people speaking and talking about it, but how do we bring all of this in a in a kind of experience, a product, if you will, that many Christians can take, especially that they can engage in, in the context that I think is most helpful to talk about politics, which is in-person, face-to-face, embodied community not on social media, and really, honestly, not so much on a like a Sunday morning service or something like that where you're sitting passively listening to one pastor talk. But really, you know, when you're talking about these sensitive, controversial, emotional, <laughs> anxious, anxiety-inducing issues like politics, I really think it is done best in person, in with people we know, live with, trust. And so that's why we wanted to create a course that small groups especially could take uh, together uh, on, on trying to help Christians shift 
to this better vision of politics. Yeah, so let, let's talk about that. Uh, by the way, I, I mean, as soon as I dove in, it, it's one of those books, like, kind of like Monty Guzman's about a, year, a little over a year ago, uh, her book, I Never Thought of It That Way, that it, it's not that I already knew this information. It's that a lot of these ideas and questions and problems have been rattling around in my brain and rattling around a lot of conversations I've been having. But you and Nancy have been able to articulate it in such a way where I'm like, yes, yes, exactly. Oh, that's a great idea. So one right toward the beginning, uh, toward the beginning of the book, uh, and I'm sure it comes up in the in the program, was this haunting image of recent history that I wasn't familiar with called Desparis, oh, excuse me, I'm going to try to say, Desaparecidos. Is that how you say it? Desaparecidos. Desa That's right. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, and ha so what is that and how does that relate to me wanting to dump a bowl of mashed potatoes on Uncle Joe's head? At <laughs> <laughs> so I, I write about this that um, in Argentina in the 1970s, uh, there was this phenomenon called the disappeared ones, los des desaparecidos. Uh, and it's where, uh, because of the political polarization that was happening in Argentinian society, uh, there was violence, and in particular state-sponsored violence, uh, where right and left were pitted against each other, and the rightist government began to disappear leftist opponents uh, through violence, through secret police. People would just disappear. And it, was, and it became this sort of, uh, it, it ultimately galvanized this movement of the mothers of the disappeared ones who began to meet, to grieve, to lament the loss of their loved ones publicly uh, in the central square in Buenos Aires. And it began a movement, it began a movement of mothers that were saying, we've, lo we've disappeared, we've lost our loved ones. And to say, this, this must end. And um, I connect that to uh, what is happening in America. And it may seem to Americans like, wow, that's an extreme comparison to connect what's happening now to this you know, awful experience of Argentinian politics. And the, the case we're making is we're on a path that way. We're on a path that way because uh, the way you get to physical disappearance, uh, to violent disappearance of your enemies that happen in Argentina is it begins with social disappearance. Once you begin to disappear others, disappear yourself and disappear others from your lives, then it, then it's because, you know, it, we lose relationship with one another and we lose our sense of common humanity that we are together made in the image of God because you're now just an abstraction. You're just now the enemy on social media or on news feeds or something like that. And what studies show is that when you have greater social disappearance from one another, it leads to openness to actual physical disappearance, like violent disappearance from another. And right now, statistics show that Americans are more open to political violence against their opponents than any other time in recent history. Uh, and January 6th should be the sort of uh, very sobering warning sign that we are very uh, prone right now. We're on a tipping point, I think, where larger numbers of people are willing to commit political violence against their opponents. And so um, that's why I wrote about this, to say we're on a path towards Los Desparecidos. We're, we're on a path towards 1970s Argentina if we continue to socially disappear from each other and and disappear each other from us right and that's happening all over it's happening in our family gatherings our friendship networks we are starting to cancel each other either you know uh very explicitly or implicitly not inviting people not seeing people not gathering together in family holidays because of political differences and that's a very dangerous path it leads us towards that that uh, possibility of of real violence um and so uh, we wrote the book, The After Party, to, to call Christians towards a different path, not further down this path of us versus them, uh, which cancels each other, which disappears uh, each other from our lives, but to say, can we come back together? And if so, how do we do this under Jesus? How, how does Jesus actually call us once again to come back together? And that's really... Uh, the message of, of the after party is unpacking what is the Jesus vision of politics that actually enables us to hold our differences together and still relate to one another, really modeling and following on Jesus because Jesus actually formed his party, the Jesus party, the disciples, the 12 disciples with, with political polarization present 
in his disciples in a, in, with an intensity of political division that would actually, you know, uh, make our political, our right, left Republican versus Democrats pale in severity. So it's not like Jesus is not familiar with or not engaging with and speaking with political polarizations in in the way that he formed his first uh, group of disciples, his first most intimate party, he was dealing with political polarization. Oh, I, so you're you're reading my you must be reading my mind because that's exactly where I wanted to go next. But I do want to give you some feedback. Uh, I think part of the goal is to get folks thinking, to kind of shake up our assumptions and dust off our you know comfortable polarized positions. And it got me thinking about a lot. Number one, when I first became a Christian over 20 years ago, my father won't uh, fess up to this, but my m mother actually told me that he considered doing what's called sitting shiva. Mm. Uh, we, grew, As you, you might remember, remember, I grew up very observantly Jewish. Yeah. Um, and I give my dad a lot of credit because he ultimately came around to the fact that he his relationship with his son was more important than even not just theological convictions as Jews. It's our heritage. It's our family. Right. It's our blood. It's That's our right. history. It's politics. It's everything. Yeah. So he valued, he, he was like the predecessor to what you're talking about. That's right. He valued our relationship yep. over, over a what, you know, yeah. this, um, but also it got me thinking about relationships that could have been lost. Uh, one came to mind just um, not too long ago, I said something on a buddy that we were in a, a Bible study with or a, a Sunday school class with for over 10 years. We raised our kids together like we were close. And I said something on a, one of his threads um, just to push back a little bit. I, I didn't think I was being too much of a jerk, but he blocked me. And I just, I wouldn't have it. I, I would not have, it's not that I wanted to pursue him to convince him that I was right or to get into a debate. I was like, yeah. Rod, we're we're like... We're people like we're, yeah. we're mishpacha. The word that comes to mind is mishpacha, the, fa the you know, family. I love it. Way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and I pursued it and he wouldn't have it. And finally I brought in some other brothers from that class. Mm. Um, and uh, when the, the good news is we, fi he finally would respond to uh, an email. We ended up getting together. I went to his office and as soon as we saw each other, we both were in tears. We're like, oh. what are we doing? <laughs> you what know, are, like exactly, exactly. What are we, what doing, are we here? doing? Yeah, no, no, so, no. I, I love that notion of what your dad talks about sitting shiva, because that's uh, just for I think everybody who doesn't know, as I understand it, that is when family and friends gather together to mourn, right? Like we mourn together the loss, and I think that that is actually why I opened the book with that story. Uh, of the mothers of the disappeared ones in Argentina because their first act was really just to, in, in the Argentinian version of sitting Shiva, they gathered yeah. together to mourn the loss of their disappeared ones. And I think we need to do that. Uh, the course, the, the after party course, and the book begin with this exercise of just naming the relationships we've lost because of politics and grieving that, mourning them, longing for the people we lost because we need to recapture this human sense of like, wait a minute, I, I, I value this person, I love this person, and we've lost this relationship because of politics? Like, is right. it really worth it? Is, that, is, is my conviction that I am right on this political issue so important to me that I, I will disappear this other person who I otherwise have loved and who I've otherwise treasured? Is it really that? Is that what God is really calling us to do? And I love your description of that moment because I think once we rehumanize each other and, and no better way to rehumanize each other than to see each other face to face, which I, I was is why I love your example of you insisting we need to, we need to look at each other in the eyes, right? Yeah. Uh, not through our positions on social media, but look at each other in your eyes, feel each other. There's something just enormously connective and human about that fundamental interaction that we need to recapture that suddenly everything else, all these political abstractions, it's not that they're not important, it's not that they don't have any value, but they suddenly like shrink back to their proper space and size. Um, uh, and then that's really, that's the experience of what we need to do. That's why the after party is trying to call Christians to back into engaging with each other face to face in person around a vision of politics that properly resizes all these issues um, and 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 um, puts them underneath in importance 
to to the Jesus vision of of politics, which is not the same thing as the Republican or Democrat vision. It's a very different vision, uh, and so that this is this is what our hope is. Yeah. Now you brought up some illustrations that in the Gospels uh, that it's not that I didn't notice them. I've read through the, I don't know how many times I've read through the Gospels now, but one in particular you you alluded to just before. Uh, I've read through the disciples, the the naming of the disciples. Yeah. Yeah. I never quite picked, even though I've read, you know, uh, Tom Wright's uh, N.T. Wright stuff. Yeah, um, I never picked up on t- Matthew the tax collector and Simon the zealot. Yeah, how how like c- could you dive into that? But also while you're doing that, there's another th- um, another illustration that's sort of related to that: the profundity of shared meals. Whether it was the seder that was the Last Supper, or you know the the resurrected Jesus. Um, saying you look troubled, but then the next question is, do you have anything to eat? <laughs> you know, what is the profundity of shared meals across our differences, across yeah. zealots and tax collectors coming together? Okay, you're asking two questions. Let me answer them both in I sequence am. Sorry. here. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, so this is something that, that Christians who have re- read the Bible, like it sounds like yourself and myself, I would say included, we just often skip over. So when yeah. Jesus enlists his disciples, uh, of his and again this is his party this is the people that he traveled with that he that he hung with uh that he ate with all the time uh, the the 12 there's a list of them and most of them are listed by the classic jewish way of identifying somebody which is son of so and so brother yeah. of so and so right your family relationship is to your identity day, yeah. ben, ben Chaim Rubin. there you uh, go so, there you Nathan, go ben, son of uh, ronnie nathan the, <laughs> that's right that's right um there's two characters that are that bear a different kind of identity, and that's exactly the two you said, Matthew and Simon. And their identity is formed by their politics right. because a tax collector and a zealot are political identities. They are, in, the Jewish's, in, the, in Jesus' Jewish context, uh, polar opposites, f- f- enemies of one another. The tax collector is the one who is essentially the collaborator with the Roman uh, regime collecting taxes on behalf of Rome uh, and therefore viewed uh, as basically aligned with Rome. The zealot, Simon, and that's Matthew is the tax collector. Simon is the zealot. He's listed as Simon the zealot, is a political party that was a sworn enemy of the Roman Empire and their Jewish collaborators like the tax collectors. And, you know, right. in Jesus, when Jesus was a boy, uh, there was a violent revolt of the zealots that actually targeted uh, tax collectors for assassination, for plunder, for burning their houses down. So this is all in the live memory of Jesus' day. And yet Jesus very deliberately, everybody's named by their normal identity except Simon and Matthew. And, And so what that tells you is one, everybody knew that Simon and Matthew were, were were like politicals. They were known by their political identity. That's how they were identified. And Jesus is making a very clear statement saying, in the most toxic, hostile political divides, both representatives of both of those two sides are going to belong to my party, the Jesus party, the 12. So that, we need to sit with that and say, oh my, okay, wait a minute. What does that say then about our political divides in our day? If Jesus, when he's saying, this is my party, I'm taking zealot and tax collectors, it must mean a different way of relating to each other uh, across our Republican, Democrat, left, right divides, other than hostility, division, and disappearance from one another. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> one of the things I was, I was curious about, I, I actually, I reached out to a couple of pastor friends of mine, um, two very, very different ter- churches. Uh, one is actually right near Fuller, uh, the one that I attend. Um, and the other is uh, the one that the Sunday school class was at, a really uh, relatively big church here in Santa Clarita. And one of the questions was, uh, how do we get people there? You know, there, there's such hostility that's built up, yeah. especially over these last several years. You know, the idea that someone who feels so strongly, whether it's about Trump or somebody who's been silenced and doesn't even want to share the possibility that they might vote for a Democrat, how do yeah. you get them there? Yeah. So I actually want this answer to the question that you asked previously, which is, I think I think shared meals are a key part. Yeah, because that was really what what Jesus did with his disciples. He called them together 
both to work, uh, follow him, learn from him, but also to eat with one another, to, to actually have this shared meal. And of course, he gave that the, the, the communion meal, the, the Eucharist, the breaking of the bread together as, as, it, as an enduring symbol, uh, the enduring enactment of his kingdom for his disciples to keep doing together. So Jesus wanted his people to break bread together across differences, united mm. around him so united that he became the meal he became the feast that everybody that 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 uh the christians across political divisions were to gather around so when you ask the question of how do you get people there i think a, cr a crucial strategy for us is again the small group gathering gathered around the meal so i i think a beautiful way to do the after party is let's do a potluck first do a potluck yeah. first, and then after we're done with the potluck, after we've broken bread, then let's go through the course together. Um, and I think the the you know, and scholars have studied this. The just the act of eating with somebody establishes a deep physical, concrete, emotional, psychic bond that is just very mysterious, right? I think this is why Jesus said, you know, you must eat of me. Like there's a communion, literal communion that happens when we commune with each other across a meal across a shared meal and um so i would strongly recommend folks to try to do the after party in a small group uh with a potluck <laughs> beforehand that's great that's great it is true and it's it was one of those um ideas that i i've been thinking oh yeah that's that's why that works and what i'm referring to is a lot of time i'm i'm in the thick of it i'm always just the nature of what i do i'm i'm always in the thick of it whether it's online or you know responses to conversations i've been having on here um, but sometimes it'll get really heated. Uh, first of all, I will try as much as possible not to engage with someone. Number one, I won't engage with somebody who's anonymous. Um, but number two, I do try to focus on people that I have relationships with. Um, if there's an established relationship already, we already have some sort of context where we're risking something, but we also have some love in the bank, if you will. That's right. That's right. But yeah. But if it gets heated... I'll often IM them, message them offline and say, hey, man, you want to gr grab a beer? Mm. I'd love to buy you lunch or something. Let's, yeah, let's get that's together. Right. It sounds, that's right. sounds like yeah. this isn't 240 character kind of a conversation. No, that's right. The more we can move our conversations around politics back to the in-person uh, engagement, and I think also move it also where you are responding to something else side by side together oh, in other words right. there's a difference between when you are doing face to face and you are right, where you right. why where you're you're it's like i believe this you believe this and so you're immediately pitted against each other across difference it's a very um subtle but i think significant shift to shift from the face to face you know where you're like i think this you think this to rather go side by side shoulder to right. shoulder and you together are responding to something else and your differences then are all understood in response to to a higher vision a higher call rather than just your your positions on x y or z issue and that's also again that's what we're trying to do with the after party is to get people side by side looking at our context our content um which is not about specific p what issues specific policy or ideological or party or candidates but it's looking it's it's, it's a higher vision of jesus and his higher vision of politics and if, if people can then, you know, kind of look, go side by side, then I think they can properly hold their differences with one another more easily um, yeah. in that posture than face to face. There's a funny uh, thing that's been happening recently on some of our uh, threads online. And um, it was in response. I, I, I lost my crap. I, I just I lost it at one point because this guy that I haven't talked to in like five years or more, all of a sudden popped up and he was just being like a bomb thrower. And um, I was like, dude, you, you haven't even liked a picture of my kids or my dog. And I, I don't know how many years. What are you doing coming in here and, you know, being a rabble rouser? So a few people on that are regular contributors, uh, they, they pop in and they'll drop in a picture of their dog. Hey, my dog says hello. <laughs> if It's getting too heated. Um, before we uh, start to wrap it up, um, I was curious if you could, one of the frameworks that was very helpful for me um, was the combatant uh, or combatant, the exhausted, and the cynic. Mm. Can you describe those categories and yeah. who, who should we all strive to be? Right. So, so back up for a moment, again, just to re reiterate, 
that the basic move that the after party is inviting Christians to do is to move from this overwhelming emphasis on the what of politics to the how of politics. Wow, right. So the what of politics is what ideology, what party is the more Christian one? What what policy is the more Christian policy? What candidate is the more Christian candidate? The what of politics. We're not saying that that's not at all important. We're saying that we have become so preoccupied in the what that we have lost sight of the Jesus how, the how of politics, which is as important and really in many ways more important than the what of politics. Not that the what is important, but the how, we've, we've sacrificed the how. And the how is really about our spiritual values that we bring to politics. And, and especially those spiritual values that govern our relationships and the pra- relational practices we engage in. So if you think about the what as ideology, party, policy, the how is spiritual values, relationships, relational practices. And the sad thing is that increasingly Christians have been willing to uh, sacrifice and ignore Jesus' teaching on the how in order to try to win on the what. When actually, if you look at Scripture, Jesus is much more clear on his spiritual values and his relationships that he wants Christians to have and the practices that should govern those relationships than he is on like, Oh, yeah, Jesus says the the right Christian border control policy is X or the right policy on military, def, you know, spending or, you know, whatever. Uh, um, so so Jesus is much more clear on the how. And so the how, central to the how, is the spiritual value of hope and humility. And if you put the values of hope and humility uh, on this sort of two-by-two two grid, you end up with this sort of a two-by-two two of where – uh, you can locate, I think, a lot of most people in, in politics. And so in this two by two, if you put hope and humility on two by two grid, the p- person that is high in hope but low in humility, that's the combatant, right? Because they're hopeful. They think they can win, uh, but they're not very humble because they think their side, they themselves, are right and everybody else is wrong, right? On the other side of that, you have somebody who is high in humility but low in hope. That's the exhausted person. That's somebody who they don't think they're, they've got all the answers, but they've given up because they think it's hopeless, right? That's the exhausted. And then the cynical is low in hope and then low in, in humility. I've described that person already. That's the person who thinks, you know, I know better than everybody else. I see more deeply than everybody else. And what everybody else misses is everything is completely hopeless. So they're both ho- low in hope and in humility. And these three quadrants, um, with the fourth quadrant being the person who is high in hope, and high in humility, we call the disciple, right? The disciple is the person who is humble. I need to learn. That's why I'm a disciple. The disciple literally is a learner. Uh, and then, but I'm also hopeful about it because I have a master. I found the master who can teach me, the rabbi who can teach me. So I'm hopeful. And I think the Jesus call is for all of us to be disciples. We're, that's what we're supposed to be, to be disciples of Jesus, high in hope, high in humility. And so the after party basically helps people identify which one are you, a combatant, exhausted, cynic? And if so, depending on which is your starting, which best characterizes your starting point, what is your spiritual growth path towards the disciple? Yeah. So we've already been talking about this, but I I, got to ask, like I said, I I do want to leave some questions for Nancy. So I'll ask our TP&R question. We've really been talking about this the whole time, but I want to ask you head on. Uh, what do you think each of us can do to be able to share space with, have better conversations with, and even nurture relationships with people across our differences? Uh, so people who think differently than we do, have different beliefs than we do, who get their news from different sources than we do, how can we do better at talking politics and religion without killing each other, or is it even possible? Well, I'm going to do the uh, pitch here, uh, okay. <laughs> which is uh, this is why we created the after party in so many different formats. Again, first the course that's out there, the book that'll be out here in a couple months in April, and then the worship song. Uh, and I would say right now, if you're looking to do something right now, uh, take the course. Take the course maybe first yourself just to check it out as an individual. And then if you feel like, hey, this is good stuff, th- invite your friends to do it with you. If you're in a small group or a Bible study, propose it as the next 
sort of six session, you know, six week curriculum for your small group to go and have that side by side experience where together you are responding to, relating to this sort of perspective of Jesus centered politics. And then within that, you can talk to each other about your politics without killing each other because you're actually learning from each other and especially learning from voices like David French, Russell Moore, and myself. So um, I, I I really want to invite people to think about that, especially if you feel like, you know, I've gone as far as I can in terms of the face-to-face -face hash out our differences, which I really think has some real limitations uh, uh, to actually work. Um, but to think, hey, can I do a side-by-side -side engagement where we're together responding to this curriculum? Now, a lot of folks who listen to this program are not Christians. Have you been getting any responses to from folks that have come in contact with the program that aren't Christians? Yeah, so we've gotten a, a lot of really great feedback. Um, now, just to be clear, the, the course is very centered on Jesus and the teachings of Jesus. So it will be most compelling to somebody who kind of believes Jesus has something really important to say. But I'll just give you an example. Uh, one of the editors that worked, that did the video editing, uh, on this course, as far as I know, not a, a, a you know, self-described Christian. But he said this is the most, one of the most important hopeful projects that he's worked on in a long time because it gives you a picture of how we can relate to politics that I think deep down anybody, not just a Christian, but a human being longs for. Like none of us really likes the sense of division, disappearance, and hostility that characterizes, but we feel trapped in it. And yeah. the, the vision that Jesus has that we don't have to live this way, I think even for somebody who's not sure what they think about Jesus and who he is, I think at least is like, well, that's, that's, that's worth listening to. That's worth at least considering. And that's at least a hopeful alternative to what we have today. Yeah. No, I mean, there's been a lot of work. Um, Tim Alberta uh, wrote a really important book that came out a couple of months ago. Robbie Jones had one that came out in September. Uh, so there's been a lot of work that is diagnosing and, and describing the problem. What I really appreciate about the uh, appreciate about the after party is that this is this is medicine. <laughs> you yeah. know, you're you're introducing the antibodies that we need in order to be better. You know, to, that's right. Um, to participate in in you know this rede redeeming the world. <laughs> you know, um, do you have any questions for me? Yeah, I want to ask you. Um, what do you think? is the appetite for this among Christians. And, and you know, where, what are you picking up as kind of hunger for a different view, different approach to politics among Christians? I think that there's a lot of pent up calluses, resistance. Uh, folks are sorting themselves in all kinds of ways, geo-sorting, church sorting. Um, it, it just so that they don't have to be around this image or illusion of a them. Uh, yeah. You know, they can't even stand to be around them. So that that's really, I think, the biggest hurdle. But again, as I described that story of me and my buddy Rod coming together, once we get together, it's like New Yorkers. The way I think of New Yorkers <laughs> is we're all kind of tough. We got this, like, thick skin because we got to be. We got to figure out how to get on the subway, get off the subway, get a cup of coffee, you know. <laughs> but once you pre penetrate past that thick skin... It's amazing how soft the heart is, yeah. you know? Yeah. So if, if we could just get them there and have the beer, have a cup of coffee, have have lunch, have a challah on this Friday night or whatever, you know, whatever your choice is. Once we're there and sharing space with, sharing time with, sharing a meal with, there, I think there are soft hearts that are just hungry, hungry for connection, for remembering, for yeah. that we're members of the same community That's right. That's and that right. we remember that. each other. So good stuff, Kurt. I just, I love talking to you, man. You just reading your stuff and just talking to you. It just, it really, it's encouraging. It gets me thinking. It challenges my assumptions. I'm convicted. Like when I read uh, Nancy's story about Kathy, oh, um, yeah. I, I, before I even read the rest of the story, like at the top, I just read the description of how Kathy was trolling David. I'm like, I got to look her up and give her some crap. <laughs> but that was like convicting to me. I'm like, oh man. All I right, well, save that story this. for when you have Nancy on. Say, I will, I will, yeah. I will. Very good. Hey, it's great talking with you, Corey. I really appreciate your, your work that you're doing here uh, with this podcast. It's, we just need more and more voices uh, like you out there. So thank you for, for stepping up. So before you go, how can listeners find you online? 
learn more about the After Party, Redeeming Babel, and all the great work you're doing. Yeah, go to afterparty.org, after-party.org to check out the course, The After Party, and encourage you to just check it out and, and uh, sample it. It's completely free. Uh, awesome. Sample one session and see if this is something that might be helpful to you personally uh, or and or to your small group or other sort of you know community that you're a part of. Uh, and then also invite everybody to join us every week uh, on uh, the Good Faith Podcast, where we talk about this and many other issues uh, helping Christians make sense of the world on the Good Faith podcast, you know, available on any of your streaming platforms. It's a great podcast. We'll be sure to uh, share all of those links uh, in the show notes. Thanks again, Curtis. This is great, man. So good to be with you, Corey. Thanks. You bet. And as always, uh, Lee. I might keep that in the recording. Um, and as always, if you dig what we're doing here, remember to follow us, subscribe to the show, um, leave a review. Like I said before, writing a review is really makes a huge, huge difference. I really appreciate the ones that have been coming in lately. And, um, you know, engage with us online. We're easy to friend. We're easy to follow. Uh, you can tell a friend about us. They can find us easily by going to politicsandreligion.us. That's www.politicsandreligion.us, all spelled out. You can find me online at Corey S. Nathan. That's Corey with an E. S is in Sam, N-A-T-H-A-N, at Corey S. Nathan. Now go talk some politics and religion with gentleness and respect, and have a great week. Thank you.